Good? Yep. Everybody, does it, you can hear me? All right. All right, good evening, everybody. We'll get started here. My name is Lisa Bowman, and I'm one of the board of directors. And on behalf of the board of directors, I'd like to welcome everybody tonight um, to come in and listen and hear um, and learn about our new superintendent, Dr. Stephen Lieber. Um, and we are really pleased and excited to have him start in about a month, a month and a day. All right, so we're, so we're almost there. Um, and we're just really excited because Dr. Lieber brings to the district the skill sets, the experience, uh, the characteristics that not only the board of directors, but the community has asked for, and we're very excited. But I will let him share that, and I will not, he can speak for himself. Uh, the format this evening is, uh, Dave will be asking them some questions. We'll be answering some questions. And so it's not a, a question answer format, but at the end, um, when it's all finished, you can more than welcome to come over and um, have some conversation with Dr. Lee So. Paige, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Because I'm, I'm going to talk first about it. Okay. Okay. So, um, first of all, show of hands, if I had not worn a coat tonight, would you have been disappointed? Okay. As if I, as if I needed one more reason to like Dr. Uh, that would be one of them. So, um, so, Paige and I are going to go to some of the questions that were collected. Uh, obviously, there were, I don't know, four or five pages of those. So we've selected some. At the end, to spare you, um, when we're done with those, you'll kind of be dismissed. And then I'll stay if anybody wants to still ask questions. But that way, I'm not holding you hostage to maybe a question that you, you know, aren't interested in. But if you have a question, I'd love to answer it for you. So um, Steve Lieber is my name. Uh, I have been in education now for 34 years. I started right out of college. Um, my wife of... 34 years. <laughs> Rosanna uh, is uh, also an educator. Um, we live in Morgantown, uh, which is really just go north on 10, and uh, we are at the, the intersection of 10 and 23. We own a farm there that has been in her family since 1909. Um, so we received the Century Farm Award back in uh, 2009. It's an old house that used to be kind of the worst farm in the valley um, when we moved in, and it's no longer the worst farm in the valley. Uh, I don't know if it's the best farm, but it's, it's, it's ours, and so we enjoy it. There's a red schoolhouse um, that is on the corner of our farm, right on Route 23. It used to be a tourist information center. Uh, we are now the proud owners of that school, uh, where my father-in-law and my wife's grandfather and all of her aunts and uncles and many cousins all went to school, and uh, we purchased that from, there was four, four Amish churches that owned that. And uh, they, uh, the tourist information business kind of died with the advent of uh, GPS and mobile phones. And so they wanted somebody to own it, and they were thrilled to hear that we would be using it for education. And um, so my wife is, is teaching in that school, she does kind of her own thing. Somebody joked today about the school I own, and I said, and, and about the decisions that I would make in that school, and I said, you've got it completely wrong. Ownership does not mean you get to make any decisions in the school. So she's pretty, she's pretty independent. She's an amazing, amazing teacher. Um, I, I always, when I got hired in one district and they hired both of us, and I said, you know, I'm glad you hired me too. She's the better of the two. Uh, she's, she's really a phenomenal, phenomenal educator. We have four kids. Um, they are all out of school, uh, out of college. Uh, all four of them attended college. Um, that really was not, wasn't a goal of ours, but I think they just felt that that was their pathway. The youngest, uh, Hayden, graduated and got married about a year ago. He celebrated his anniversary this weekend. He is a math uh, and physics teacher in Southern California. Uh, his, the next youngest, Emma, or, or number three, she's a speech pathologist in Southern California. Um, I actually grew up, when I was 17, I, I moved out of Southern California. So because we were overseas when our kids all went to college, it didn't matter where they went, they weren't gonna be near mom and dad. So 
our two youngest went to California because uh, their favorite aunt lives in California. And Aunt Kathy, my oldest sister, spoils my kids much more than me. But they all want to be close to Aunt Kathy. That was a, a real benefit. So Emma is a speech pathologist. She is also married. Her husband is in construction. Um, they live in Long Beach. The third, the sec second oldest daughter, uh, Kate. Kate married her high school sweetheart from Doha, one of the places where we lived. Um, he's a German national who is a doctor, a pediatric ICU doctor. He just finished his fellow finishing his fellowship this month. And they're moving with our two grandchildren to Tucson, Arizona. Uh, Kate is a pediatric ICU nurse, but she has also worked um, at Bellevue. I don't know if you know Bellevue, the psych hospital in New York City. That was intense. Uh, she worked there for a year while Josiah was finishing medical school at Cornell in Manhattan. And uh, she also worked at Dartmouth Hitchcock uh, in New Hampshire where he was doing his residency. So they are both in pediatric ICU, which is a really, really intense job. Most of the kids they deal with don't survive. And um, she values being in ICU because Josiah can actually talk with her about his patients because they're also hers. Otherwise, that it's just really, really hard for doctors to deal with that. Our oldest is not married, although we're expecting maybe she will surprise us one of these days. Um, she lives in Hawaii. Uh, her degree is in uh, economic development and political science. She owns a consulting firm. She has a really interesting background, really interesting job that she worked that kind of prepped her to be a consultant. What she does is she helps startups leverage their best customers for growth, because that's what she did for a company for five years. And so she works with about four companies at a time, uh, usually small startups. They don't pay a lot of money, but she, uh, it's enough to make a living. And she has uh, created a, another business where she rents camper vans in Hawaii. So there's six on the main island, and she owns four of them. And uh, it's a very, it's an interesting business. She's doing really well with that. So that's our four kids. They are all doing well. None of them are living in my basement playing video games. Um, so. There's a new definition of good parenting. I think that's part of it, is they're not in your basement playing video games. They're all gainfully employed. Um, my, my daughter and her, my daughter and son-in-law just bought a house that is the house I've never been able to afford, but I guess when you're a pediatric ICU doctor, you can do that. Um, so my journey. Uh, my, my, I'm a, my, my father was a, a minister, and um, so we, we grew up, I grew up mostly in Los Angeles, which is not a good, I, I, it was a bad time to live in LA in my formative years. It's interesting, my sister, Kathy, who's five years older than me, who's still in LA, had a completely different experience than I did, just five years. It was the advent of um, crack cocaine in Los Angeles, and we lived in Hawthorne, which is um, Hawthorne Borders, Inglewood and Watts, which is kind of where all the racial tensions have tended to be. And uh, so I just grew up in a place where I was, um, in many instances, I was the minority. Um, and I, I, don't, I didn't have fond memories of Southern California. So when my parents decided to move me from Southern California to Southern Manitoba in Canada, to a one stoplight town, I, my mom says it was traumatic. I don't remember it that way. I remember kind of exhaling and thinking, okay, I don't have to worry about falling out of LA. And interesting, my kids, two of my kids now live there, and they think it's great. So I think my experience was just, was just the anomaly. Um, two years of high school in Canada, that was my first international experience. Um, a little, little tiny town where my dad was the pastor of a church that I think 20% of the town went to. Um, so it was a big church in a small town, so everybody knew who I was. And, you know, no breaks, no, you were literally in a fishbowl there. But I left and went to college in Minneapolis, which was about eight hours away from where my parents were. I definitely wanted to be back in the U.S. I, I was always patriotic, but living outside of the U.S. made me even more patriotic as an 18-year-old. Uh, with a brother who was serving in the military. And, um, I remember the invasion of Grenada, my brother was 
in the first wave um, in Grenada. And boy, the Canadians had harsh, harsh words. And I, I really struggled with that. So I was glad to come back to the US, went to college in Minnesota, uh, a little, little small, tiny little college, Crown College, uh, Division Three, but it was so small I could play sports. Met my wife there, um, studied history, and um, the last year, she, so Rosanna, brief bio, she's got a much more interesting story, but she's not here, so I'm not going to tell all of it. Uh, her father was Amish, and left Amish when he was, the Amish when he was 20, and he was immediately drafted into the army at the end of the Korean conflict, and he was not that not Amish. So he wasn't, he was, he was not Amish anymore, but he wasn't, he, so he went to South America to do civil service in lieu of military service. And uh, loved where he was in Peru um, and, and stayed there. Um, her mother was a single teacher, music teacher, to like missionary kids in an international school. And her mom and dad met down there. So her, our whole senior year, she tried to make an arrangement to go to the school where her mother taught to do her student teaching. And when they finally came back and said, yes, you can do it, but we don't have any elementary positions. We only have secondary history, which was like, And so she said, well, I guess you're supposed to go. So, sorry, Joe, would it be better if I just stood you're in fine. one place? You're fine. Poor <laughs> <laughs> guy. I feel like she's up reaching the camera. I guess she's just scaling back. Um, so I got to go to South America, and it was interesting because my wife and I dated all the way through college, all four years. And she's very, she's very Latin, has a lot of Latin traits because that's where she grew up. And I, I just didn't understand her until I got there, and I was like, oh, there's a whole continent of people like her. They all have these, these, these traits. And so it was really good, but that was kind of my wanderlust for living overseas. Um, after finishing my student teaching, came back, we got married that summer, we moved to Florida. Because that's what you do when you lived in Manitoba, Minnesota. You seek someplace warm, because I grew up in Los Angeles, and that was a little warm. So I went to Florida, uh, Palm Beach County. We were there for seven years. Um, I worked, my first teaching position was in a little school that had a severe inferiority complex. They, they had really good people. They just, they, just, they just didn't have any systems. And I didn't know any better. I was a young teacher. And, the school where my wife worked was this really big, elite private school. And um, we were doing an accreditation. Our school was getting accredited, and their dean of students came and sat in my classroom for a week. I don't think he observed anybody else. He just sat in my classroom. At the end of the year, they offered me a job to come over to her school, King's Academy, great school. And I worked there for, I guess, four years, so three years and four years. And after that, our, my father-in-law, invited us to come and take over this family farm, which was had been rented for 70 years when we moved in. The owner had not lived in it for 70 years, so you can imagine there was, there was a lot of work to do. That first year I got hired at Garden Spot High School to coach football, which is, I played football in college and I had coached football in Florida and uh, didn't think I was going to go back in the classroom at that point. I was kind of burned out. And then in November, they hired me to come as a long-term sub, and that turned into a permanent position. And then I became the head football coach, and then I became the department supervisor, and I you know, kind of got rolling. And all the things I wanted to do, like go to graduate school, I started to do and um, spent eight great years in Eastern Lancaster County. Um, I was in a master's in history program at Villanova, and I really enjoyed it. It's one of my regrets is that I never finished that. But I had started this history program thinking that I would always be a history teacher and maybe someday I would be a professor. Um, and then I got this job as a supervisor and the superintendent said to me, hey, uh, have you ever thought of being a principal? And my response was, the only time I thought of being a principal was the time I thought, man, I never want to be a principal. <laughs> and he said, well, look, you have to get a supervisor's license because of the job that you've just gotten. And it's 18 credits. And a principal certification is 18 credits. Why don't you just get the principal cert? You never, when you're old and gray, maybe you want to be a principal. So I thought, well, that's sound thinking. So I started this program, this principal cert. 
And by the time I finished that, I was closer to a master's in ed leadership than I was in the history, so I had to let the history go. Along the way, um, I realized that I was learning a lot about how schools ideally should function. I had no intention of doing anything except being a football coach and being a supervisor. But along the way in that coursework, I was kind of confronted with some things that, you know, you see things, and every, no school's perfect. Every school has issues. Every school has things that have to be addressed. And I was learning about those things. And what I realized was I, I now kind of knew too much. I, I either needed to take a step into some other form of leadership or I needed to back up, close my door, and just do the things that I should do in teaching. And uh, the second one just didn't, just didn't seem to be, that's not the coach. The, the coach wants to go and work hard to improve and to fix it. So I applied at a school that everybody told me, you're gonna blow your first interview. And so I applied at a school that I thought would, would, would never hire me. It was safe because they were, you know, they were a better district, and high achieving, and um, I had coached against them. I thought there's no chance of getting this job, but maybe, maybe, maybe I can get an interview. And I did blow the interview, um, and they did hire me. So it's, you know, sometimes when there's no other candidates, even the person who blows the interview can get the job. But that was at Wilson, um, Wilson High School in Berks County. And I took that job as an assistant principal in their high school, and um, I replaced a guy who had been doing the job for 30 years. And every single discipline incident in that school came to his desk. If you didn't have a pencil, if you were late to class, if you skipped detention, if you sassed the teacher, didn't matter how great or how small, it came right to my desk in this huge high school. And I was just overwhelmed by kids coming back over and over and over and over and over and never learning. And the consequences, they, they, this guy had an amazing system of consequences. And it was doing nothing to support these kids. It was doing nothing to get them to change the way they functioned. And that first year was really, really tough. And I went into the guy who hired me, Jerry Slemmer. Jerry is a Hall of Fame football coach here in Pennsylvania, a man of incredible integrity. He was the assistant superintendent that hired me. I went in and I just said, Jerry, I am struggling in this job. Where do I learn? And I listed like five things. Where do I learn these things? He said, well, see, there's two places you can learn that. One is the school heart knocks. That's where you are right now. And the second place you can learn that is in a doctoral program. I was like, in a doctoral program? It was like stuff like change theory. Really? So School of Hard Knocks wasn't cutting it, so I enrolled in this doctoral program. And, um, and now I got this advanced course in how schools should run and you know, what it should look like. And what does leadership do? What, is, what, what are power dynamics? Who has power in school? Everybody thinks they know who has power in school. I guarantee you most people don't realize where the power is in the school. It's not with the principal. It's not with the superintendent. It's in a lot of places. So I was learning all of this stuff along the way, and, uh, and then this really, um, our four kids um, really wanted to go overseas. And I had had the bug to go overseas from when I was there, and my wife had grown up overseas. And so in 2008, we, we left the US, I left Wilson. I left the job that was amazing. Um, everybody's like, well, why, why would you do that? Uh, well, it was a chance for our kids to, to live in a different part of the world, and something would die. So we moved to the Middle East, to Doha, Qatar, to a school that I didn't really know anything about, but it was, it was just a phenomenal school. Oh my goodness, it was amazing. Amazing teachers, amazing kids, amazing connections, uh, amazing leadership. Deb Welch um, is the best, the best leader I have ever worked with. And I learned so much from her. I learned so much about organizational change, because this was a school that was absolutely pushing on everything just push, push, push. And learning how to manage that. Learning, you know, how do you, how do you do that and not lose all of your people? How do you do that and not lose families? How do you, how do you make substantive changes and have people in the community embrace the substantive change, not just push back on it? 
And so that's what I was learning there. Our last child was a sophomore in high school, and I took a, a high school principal job in the region in Dubai, really so he could stay in the Middle East. So he could have the same experience his sisters had had at an international school. And uh, those, those Dubai years were, those were tough. Um, I know Jill said she's going to put this on the, on the website, so I hope nobody from Dubai sees it. But um, entitled, entitled people, it was, it was, it was tough. It was, uh, um, I said to my wife, this job is either going to teach me everything I need to know about leading the school or it's going to kill me. Um, I don't think it's everything I need to know, but I learned a lot. But at the end of, of that, 2018, all of our kids had graduated from overseas schools, all were back home. And my wife and I both had parents that were sick. And so we came home in 2018. Um, I really, we own a couple businesses. Uh, we're not wealthy, but we've been blessed. And I wasn't sure I was going to go back to work with schools um, until a good friend of mine who I had worked with um, said, look, I really, I really think you should apply for this job in Kutztown. And I did. Um, I've been home about 10 months when I went to work for Kutztown, and it has been just fantastic. Um, it's a, it's a high-performing district, um, but a little bit static. When, when you're a Blue Ribbon High School, which I think there's two in Pennsylvania, when you're a Blue Ribbon High School, what do you need to change? There's just, it's, well, they, that's the perception. But the truth is, working in some of the schools I worked in, were also really good, but they were always, look, there's always something we can be better at. One of the questions the board asked me in the interview process was, um, you know, how do you feel about being in school improvement and improving schools? And, and my answer was, we're always going to improve. It doesn't matter if the state is saying you need to improve it. That's, that's okay, duh. Well, we know that. But we're always, uh, in, in, under my leadership, it's just what I just believe we should. And so, um, so it's been great there. I've, I've gotten to do so many things. I've learned an awful lot. Um, but what drew me to Octorera is one of Paige's questions. So I'm not going to answer that one. Um, and I think you've heard enough. Nobody's sleeping yet, but still have some time. So um, that's I, I. I decided I would tell you more than you probably wanted to know rather than you leaving thinking, well, he didn't tell us anything. So I kind of went with more than you wanted to know. Uh, but that's a little bit of a capture of our family. Um, I, one, one last thing. There were several transformational experiences for me in my journey. The first was when I was a high school teacher. I, I taught in the classroom for 15 years. And in year about 10, I was when I I had become a supervisor before that. And we studied for, for four or five years our dropouts at Eastern Lancaster County. So we had kids that were dropping out in their senior year, some in their junior year, and we studied who are these kids and where did the system start to fail them. And what we determined was it was in ninth grade. Now, we had control, I had control over ninth grade. So it may have been earlier than ninth grade, but we, because of credits, it was, it was functionally beginning in ninth grade. And all of our dropouts had failed English or social studies in their freshman year or both. And they got behind in the credit count and they couldn't get caught up, so they couldn't go to the career center. So they couldn't, so they couldn't, so they couldn't, so they couldn't. So they couldn't. And after studying this for a number of years, we said, we have got to put together a program that keeps this from happening. Because it's becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. So we took the 30 lowest achieving kids in a class of 300 that didn't have an IEP. So kids that were, when I went to talk to the director of pupil services, I said, Jim, we've got like 30 kids. They're all D's and F's. This is what I was told. He says, Steve, those kids are performing right where they should perform. You have D's and F's. And, and, and our attitude was, no, no, that's, we think we can do something to turn this around. And we did. I worked in that program for three years. I also taught the highest achieving kids in the school, because I was a supervisor. I could give myself whatever schedule I wanted. But I taught the at-risk kids, and I taught kind of the high-end kids. 
and I learned more. I could have never been even remotely successful in administration without those three years with those kids. Because I learned a lot about when they don't perform, why? What are some of the reasons? And I'll tell you, we had 90 kids in my three years. There were 90 different reasons why they were not performing. But it was, it was a seminal moment for me the day I embraced that. And we started to work on that. The second thing that really impacted me was when I got to Wilson and the, I was just this barrage of discipline. And I would call parents because of communication. It's, you know, I've seen it in all of your documentation, better communication. And I would hold the phone out here as they screamed at me. You're trying to abuse my kid. You're this, you're that. No, 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 I really want to help. And we embarked on something that today I, I'm, I'm chagrined to hear it, it being bashed. Um, and that's um, restorative practices. And some of you have heard that. Restorative practices comes out of reform schools. Kids who are in placement, how do you get them to change? That's where restorative practices come. Restorative practices doesn't mean there's no consequences. It means that I started to spend a lot of time with kids so that they wouldn't keep coming back to my office. And um, years later, Matt Bender, who's, um, he was an assistant principal for a long time. Now I think he's the director of HR at Wilson. I heard him talking to other people. And um, because I was the one doing all that discipline, and we had several deans of students, I kind of dove into restorative practices because I needed something. And suspending these kids, sending them to alternate ed, um, detention, it just wasn't working. They were just right back every week. And uh, we, we, we embarked on this. And I heard Matt Bender later telling a group of principals that Wilson High School, from the moment we started restorative practices, this was, this was probably eight years later, he said their discipline has continued to go down. And it's just because it's meaningful conversations with kids about the choices they're making and what they're doing. So that was the second kind of transformative thing. The third one was working with Deb Welch. Um, Deb was a master at getting people to come to consensus around what we should do. And she was an incredible leader, and she never did it with a heavy hand, ever, ever. And I could tell you stories of where I saw her handle things differently than I would have handled them, than I had handled them in the past, and how effective it was. Um, following Deb, I went through a lot of pretty extensive training on facilitation, and how do you get 55 angry people to all come to a common place of thinking. And it's possible to do. The woman who, who I kind of did the training with for weeks um, actually sat down with the Israelis and the Palestinians. Unsuccessfully. But Carol McCandridge was with, that was the level that she worked at. And so that has been very, very helpful to me as well because it has changed the way I function with groups, the way I function with teachers, the way I function with parents especially how I function with our educational leadership. Because in order to build lasting change, there's certain things that have to be in place. And I learned that from Deb and another superintendent named Brent Munch. Um, so I am just uh, incredibly blessed to have worked with some of the people that I work with. So I know you're all wondering, so why would you come to Dr. Rarity? And that's where Paige is going to step in. So there we go. No, you can start wherever you want. Okay, so the first question I have is what plans or ideas do you have that you want to implement in order to help children that are behind academically or misbehaved? Yeah. That was really why I told the story of the at-risk kids, because um, there, is, there is help for all kids. One of the things that I learned, um, there's a, a researcher out of the University of Pittsburgh uh, named Lauren Resnick, and Lauren Resnick teaches Effort-based intelligence. Effort-based intelligence. So what she says is, and, and how many are familiar with the book uh, Mindset by Carol Dweck? Probably some of the educators are. Uh, it, comes, it comes kind of out of Carol Dweck's work in Mindset, but effort-based intelligence is this. You don't, you're not born smart. You become smart. 
And this is, this is the great fallacy in education is we believe that kids either have it or they don't. And I have a, a story, quick one, sorry. Everything is through stories. Um, I'm pretty good with a skid loader. Um, live on a farm, you kind of have to be. Uh, but I had some work that um, I needed, and so I, um, I called my neighbor who does the farming on our land. I said, hey, Ernie, can you send me, send me somebody who's pretty good with a skid loader? I got some work that's beyond what I can do. And so he sent me a kid. The kid that he sent me was a kid named Roman. Roman was one of my at-risk kids. Roman was what I would call a reluctant learner. Not at all interested in anything I was, you know, dishing out in, in class. But he's 15 years old, and he's a magician with a skid loader. So all the things that Roman insisted in my classroom he could not do, he came and just implemented amazing things. I just couldn't believe the work that he could do. I couldn't believe it. And that was one of the moments I was like, okay, yeah, effort-based intelligence. That um, all kids can learn. Different, different capacities. You have, you have students who have some types of barriers and limitations, but, but all kids can learn. And um, that's, that's probably the most important thing that, uh, you know, I don't, don't tell me. I've had, I've had students, when I was a middle school principal, I had a meeting. This was in an overseas school which are selective admissions, so if you don't meet a certain standard, you can't be in that school. And so I met with the elementary principal who told me that I was going to have to exit a fifth grader coming into sixth grade because he could not do the work in sixth grade. He would never be on grade level. He would never be successful. The problem was that boy was the son of my assistant principal. So I was supposed to tell my assistant principal that he had to find in a Muslim country where there are no American schools. He had to find someplace else for Ben to go to school. That was kind of how we did things. And you know what? I, that's, I, no, we're going to figure it out. Ben today is in college studying computer programming. All kids can learn. And, and we have to remember that when we're dealing with students who struggle. There's reasons they struggle. My wife was telling me about a girl today who's, who's dyslexic, and, um, and her work habits are, are not very good. And I'm dyslexic. And I said to her, well, you know, hon, most of those behaviors, most of those behaviors are because she's masking what she can't do. And so she acts out, or she acts like she's not interested. I took, my, my wife graduated summa cum laude, which is, for those of you, that's the highest you can get in college. I graduated. Lordy, I'm glad I made it. <laughs> and I took one class with her when we were freshmen. And we sat down to study. And she just was, she had all. And th this, is, this is the honest truth. I decided at that time not to study for that class. And the reason psychologically was, I knew she was smarter than me. This is, I was, I was 18 years old. I knew she was smarter than me. I didn't want to know how much smarter. And the only way I could protect myself was to not try in that class, take the C. And then I didn't have to grapple with the fact she was just smarter than me. Now, only one of us has a doctor, so. <laughs> not, not that I'm smart, that's not it. I had, but I had, I had to learn, I had to learn how to learn as a 20-year-old, because I hadn't been taught how to learn and how to overcome those things. Sorry, I'll try to be short on the next one. Okay, so then the next one is, what are your goals for Octora, and are you committed to staying here long enough to see these goals come to fruition? This is funny, because some of my colleagues at, at Coastown said, I thought you were going to retire. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I've signed a five-year contract, and, and you know, and, and maybe eight years. And they're like, eight years? And I said, well, here's the thing. Um, for the, the types of changes that you do in a school, it, it takes three to five years. And it, at five years, you're really only starting to, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Jim Collins, the book called Good to Great. He talks about a flywheel. And to get a flywheel going, it's a heavy wheel. And once you get it going, you don't have to touch it very much. It'll just keep going. But getting it going is, is hard work. 
And that's your five years, is getting the flywheel going. And then once things are going, it's much easier. So um, yeah, I, I hope that the people at La Carrera and the board um, finds the work that we do fulfilling and rewarding and that we can see measurable results and that um, and I, I, I don't anticipate working for anybody else. Uh, I think this is, this is where I'd like to be and, and there's a lot of other reasons why, um, but you know, I, I am committed to improvement. And then this one you kind of started bringing up a little earlier is what does Dr. have that makes you want to take this job? Yeah. George Fiore, who's the Chester County IU Executive Director, was a teacher when I went to Wilson. And George contacted me way back, way back about this job. And I was like, ah, I don't think so. I don't think I'm interested. And that's, that's when I was talking about retirement. And, uh, and then I went and I thought, and George was like, you know, you need to look at this, you need to look at this school. You need to look at this district. And then uh, CCIU wrote the description of what you were looking for based on the community feedback. And, and what I read in that description honestly was what made me go to the website and look closer. Because what I read was this is a district who, who is not happy with where they are. Not that that's a bad thing, but this is a district that is committed to improvement. They want to see improvement, and I was in a, a district where um, I am in a district where I, I, I sometimes question our commitment to getting better. I, I, and I and if we're yes, we have kids that go to Ivy League schools, and but we have 30 or 40 percent of our student population. I'm not sure we're serving as well as we could. And I think the same could be said in Octorera. Are we serving the 30 to 40 percent of our population that? You know, we think you can't learn, we think is a different demographic that we think, we think, we think, we think. And what I read led me to believe that, you know, this might be a district. And then every, every conversation I've had with the board, every conversation I've had with administrators, teachers since then has convinced me and affirmed, no, this is, this is a district that really wants to move in a direction that's positive. And understand, I, I've worked in great schools. And the best schools were all doing that. They were not happy with where they were. They were always trying to reach more kids and to move. And so I dug a little deeper. I started reading up on the district, and what convinced me was, believe it or not, your CTE program. The 11, the 11 um, schools, 11 programs that you have, the articulation agreements that you have with colleges and universities, understand every district in the state is trying to figure out what you guys have already figured out. You started a long time ago. Everybody's trying to figure it out, but they can't afford it. And you guys have committed to it. And when I saw that, I was like, okay, this, this is now interesting to me. Because they have programs for the kids who, are, who may or may not be college bound, and they seem to be really taking care of them. And I understand that we have taken pretty good care of the kids who are college bound. But in all of it together, it just seems like a district that really would like to serve their kids better. And that is what I'm all about. I don't, I don't care about money, I don't care about stature, I don't care about, I, I care about are we getting better and are our kids being served better. What effect can the superintendent have on school climate? Yeah, what effect can the, can the superintendent have on school climate? Superintendents set the tone for everything. Um, uh, that kid, Ben, that they told me I had to dismiss from the school, um, it's very personal. A couple years later, um, I, I walked into a meeting and one of our teachers, um, Matt Erico, the best language arts teacher I've ever encountered in my, in my whole life. And Matt Erico was talking about Ben with his back to me. He didn't know I was there. And there were people that were kind of banging on Ben, what Ben couldn't do, what Ben, you know, and, and Matt, was, Matt was saying, guys, when Steve talks about Ben, it's almost like he's talking about his own kid. So we have to figure this out. We have to. Because he's, he's not going to be okay with us saying Ben can't do it. The effect that a leader has is there's a trickle-down effect 
on other leaders in the school and ultimately teachers and most importantly on the students. And if it doesn't come from above, where is it coming from? I teach a class in, in change, a doctoral class in change theory, and uh, I think it's Harvard University puts out this, this tool that you can use to analyze any of any initiative that you would like to introduce or an initiative that you have introduced and you'd like to do a postmortem on. And in this tool, the most powerful thing is, does the superintendent support it? If the superintendent is ambivalent, it's going to fail. No question. It's going to fail. And so it all starts at the top. The hope for kids, the challenge for kids, it all starts with the superintendent. And I don't think I knew that in a deep way until I worked for Deb Welch and Brent Munch. And that was, that was when I understood it. That Deb directed everything in the school with how she talked to us and the standard that she held us to as principals. For our next question, it says, how will you prepare students for 21st century careers in schooling, as well as how will you prepare teachers to enable these for students? Yeah, that's the CTE program. Um, I, think, I think there's always going to be more that we can do, and um, sometimes it means uh, a program that's less effective, you bolster, sometimes it means you, you stop doing something that's not effective, and you start doing something that's going to be more effective. Our, our, our people here, I, I, get, I get a lot of minutes and notes that are being sent to me so that I can kind of catch up on what conversations are happening in meetings. And um, There's something that, that um, the leadership in the school district has been studying, and that is um, what's, what's called a portrait of a graduate. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a product. Somebody comes and kind of wants to sell you services to develop a portrait of, of a graduate. But really, it's just defining what do we want our graduates to look like because we're not sending everybody to college. But what skills, what types of things, and that's something that uh, your leadership team has been exploring, and it's something that I spent the last year exploring as well for Kutztown. And um, I very much believe that we are preparing the kids for a world that, well, okay, I was at, how many came to OA Best, okay? Did you see the um, Did you see the the trailer where the gaming was? Did you notice that? I talked to the owner of that. I said, "That's really fascinating. That's a fascinating model." He goes, "Yeah, it's great. I got my two brother my two brothers working it. I just I own it. They do all the work, and I drive it around." And um, so we started talking. I said, "So what do you do?" He says, "Oh, I, I do three events on Saturday and three or four on Sunday, and I drive around. I go to somebody's birthday party and." Um, and they go in and they play games for a few hours and then I drive to the next place and he says, it's a great living. Most of the jobs that our kindergartners are gonna do haven't been invented yet. Do you, do you have, do you, have you heard that statistic? Most of what our kids are gonna do hasn't even really been invented. Now, farming is gonna be different. Wholesale is gonna be different. Um, but we have got to prepare kids for something other than a factory model. This, you know, this whole idea that schools haven't changed in 100 years or 150 years is very real, because everything else is changing. So, Portrait of a Graduate is about, okay, what do we need to change so that our kids are more able to go into the world and succeed? Um, how do you listen to staff concerns? <laughs> staff concerns. Got my card here. So, um, this comes out of a school improvement model from a group called Studer, Studer Education, and it's called, it's called Rounding, and we do this with all of our employees at Kutztown. Um, and it's really simple. Uh, and we do it with custodians, we do it with paraprofessionals, we do it with teachers, we do it with, with everybody. And um, all of our leadership do it, and they all go and put the information that they get back from people into one spreadsheet, and then we sit at meetings and talk about what did we learn from our rounding process. And it's really simple questions, I'll put my glasses on. So this is a, so this is the round of questions. So I'm sitting with a custodian, okay? And I say, okay, so what's, what's working well? In, in the, and they'll say, in the whole school, I'll say, no, no, in your job, what's working well, the custodial services? And they'll tell me, and I might ask some probing questions. And I'll say, so what's been challenging? And 
one lady was like, our, our big vacuum cleaner is broken. The, the, the really big one they use in the auditorium has been broken for two years. She's like, do you know how long it, is, it takes to clean that auditorium with a, with a regular vacuum cleaner? She was like, three of us in there. So I went to the director of, the, of, of facilities and operations. I said, the vacuum cleaner's broken. He goes, yeah, they broke it. I said, okay, but, but they don't have a vacuum cleaner. Yeah, they broke it, Steve. Okay, why don't we fix the vacuum cleaner? Because I think they might be more effective. Well, okay, so they did, and that custodian, the day the vacuum cleaner is done, and she knows she told me it, everybody's happier. Um, so it's, it's all about a, a superintendent, um, board members, you can check out on this one. A superintendent can see about 5% of the problems in the district. Truthfully, that's statistically, it's out of, they've studied it. You, you cannot see very much. Principals can see 10 to 15% of the problems. If you really want to know, you got to go and ask people. Okay, next question. How could I be more helpful? I hate that one. I hate that one. Because you just they look at me and go, I don't even know what you did. How can you help me? So in that case, it was fix the vacuum cleaner. And then I, the next one is, do you have the resources and support that you need? That's one they always want to talk about. Yeah, we could use, or yeah, no, I've got everything I need, we're, we're good. And then I'll ask, who has been helpful to you? And they'll always, they, they, sometimes they want to give me three people, but I say, no, no, just one person. Uh, and they tell me why that person has been helpful, and then, and then our people go and they, they hand write a note to that person and tell them why they're getting a note, thank you for being helpful. This is an incredible morale booster. Simple process, all of your leaders do it. You just talk to all of your employee groups throughout the year and you're constantly addressing little things. It's what allows a superintendent to see more than 5%. So thank you for asking that question. Yeah. Again, this next one's pretty wordy. So in your experience, what is the single most damaging characteristic to the educational and personal growth of students within a school system? And how can you prevent it from becoming a characteristic of the after area schools? When teachers and educators and parents think kids can't learn. Simple. What, what do I think is the greatest detriment is when people put caps on kids. One of our presidents called it the soft bigotry of low expectations. Oh, poor kid. He just doesn't know any better. That's that, that one, um, the people that I work with figure out really quickly, don't don't say that one, because that's one that is, you know, who is going to reach these kids if we're not going to? Who's going to do it? And just saying they're not going to be able to, um, look, every there's a lot of Roman Gortmans out there. There's a lot of Ben Gores out there. And it's our job, it's our job to reach them. It's not our job to work them through the system. It's our job to reach them. How would you determine a school's need versus want? Yeah, how would you determine a, a need versus a want? It's kids first. How are kids impacted by the decision? That's, that's the litmus test. Um, one of my questions is what resources do you need as a teacher? Or as a, a, that's, that's an important one. Um, and those can sometimes be wants. Uh, but it's always driven by what's good for kids. And the thing that I will always want to know from a principal or from a teacher or from a custodian is how is this better for kids? How is this? Because if it's better for kids, we, we can probably pursue that as something that, you know, if it's, if it's a big, big goal, we, maybe we can't do it for a couple of years. But if it's, if it's something that is going to ultimately be good for kids, that, that, that's something I can usually get behind. And that's how I would separate needs from wants. Um, I lost it. Oh, who do you struggle to work with and why? The person who believes kids can't learn it. <laughs> it's, I, I'm, I'm kind of a simple guy. Um, yeah, I just, uh, I've been out of the classroom now for seven, 17 years, I think. What did I say, 34? 14? 17? Um, and so sometimes teachers will, will accuse me of not really understanding what they do. 
And that's true, it's hard to fully understand what they do when you've been far away, it, it is true. Um, but I worked in the environment none of them were willing to work in. I, we took the kids, the two kids in every classroom that the teacher put one in that corner and one in that corner, we took all of those kids and put them in two classrooms together. And, and that, was, that was where I learned what really matters in a classroom and what really matters for kids. And for anybody who doesn't think that they're going to benefit from working with students who will challenge them, that's where the greatest learning takes place. There's kids you can put in a classroom with a book. They have a book, and you sit in the classroom, and they'll learn. Those, that's not great teaching. Great teaching. At Matt Errico, that, that guy that talked about Ben in the classroom, Matt was such a good teacher, but he, when we first started working together, he only liked to teach the top kids. And he was good with them. Oh my gosh. He'd get them to do unbelievable work. And I kept challenging him. I said, Matt, you're only as good as your bottom quartile. Show me your bottom quartile. And you know, your, your bottom 25% in your class, show me where their achievement is. That will convince me how good you are. And I think I told him that for three years. And then one day I heard him telling another teacher, you're only as good as your bottom quartile. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I think that all of our, and, and this, is, this is a controversial one for teachers who might be watching this or sitting in the room. Um, our best teachers need to teach all of our kids. You don't, you don't. <laughs> I could have taught all AP classes in year 15. I taught the sweat off because I chose to because I was learning a lot and they were being successful. And they were going from being the bottom of the class to, um, I remember my wife would just be astounded because one day a kid showed up on my porch, it was Thanksgiving break. And I was, and he was coming home from Penn State main campus. He had enrolled in a program that was going to, um, it was gonna, he was gonna finish with a master's in landscape technology, landscape architecture or something. It was one of our group kids, it was one of our low achieving kids, and he was coming to my house before even going home after his first time at Penn State main campus, because he wanted to tell me about what he was doing. Talk about an amazing affirmation of taking kids on the bottom and helping them to see themselves differently. Um, I struggle when people don't want to see that. I, I don't have a problem if you can't see it. If you don't want to see it, that, that's where I'm at. <coughs> um, would you embrace change if you see current policies that are not working and causing misalignment in our schools? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, the, yeah. The question is, do I? What, what do we do if things aren't working? Um, I'm, I'm not a proponent of just quickly scrapping things. I need to see longitudinal data to conclude that something's not working. Um, the problems we have in most instances in schools is we either don't have data, or we don't use data. We don't, we don't use it effectively. We have data that we're not really looking hard at. Now, the other interesting thing is. Um, a kid can, you also need multiple forms of data. Just your report card, so, so in the, the international schools that I worked in, kids would come and it was selective admission, so we didn't admit everybody. We had waiting lists in every grade level. And we would get like a report card from international school Timbuktu, straight A's. That told me nothing, absolutely nothing about what they could I didn't know who was giving the A's. I didn't know what they were asking them to do. So we developed our own process where they had to get recommendation forms from their teachers. The teacher, and we would write, um, we, we studied this, sorry, this is a, a tangent that I probably should not go on. We studied how do we get our kids to be successful when we had, we had kids from 79 countries in our school, 79 countries. And our kids performed at a rate where they were growing 33% faster than the average in the US from 79 countries. And so our question was, how do we get, how do we, how do we help these kids to be successful? And what we learned was we had to give a learning habit grade because learning habits were the only thing that kids controlled. 
and it was the best indicator of, of how they were going to be, whether they were going to be successful or not. So we would use learning habits, we would use um, a benchmark score, like some type of internationally normed test, the one I prefer is the one you use, NWEA MAP. Um, I, MAP is, is far and away the best tool in, in my mind. We use that, and then we use our local grades. And we looked for agreement between two of those. So the grades could be terrible, and if their work habits were high, I didn't care about the grades. And I would tell the parents that I don't want you to focus on the grades. Because these learning habits, we're, we're assessing learning habits, and the learning habits are all high. So that means eventually this grade is going to catch up, because they're working hard. They're doing all they can do. And their learning habits were low. OK, let's address the learning habits. Forget about the grades again. Let's just address the learning habits. So um, sorry, I forgot what your question was, Paige. <laughs> they, they're saying move on with their eyes. Yes. Okay. This is the final question. Do you view the fine arts as an academic discipline equal to math, science, etc.? Was that your question? No. No. But thank you. <laughs> Whoever did. Um, listen, um, I always say I'm going to write a book, and there's three books I'm supposed to write, according to what I tell my friends. Um, the one that I really, I really feel that I the American education system, if I asked you, where do we rank in the world? Most of you would say, oh, you know, we're somewhere below you know, such and such. Um, the American education system is the best education in the world, hands down. Hands down. And here's why. Uh, in Japan, only 66% of high school students get a chance to go to high school. 33% are drummed out of the system and put into like a vocational track. Not their choice. They are tested out. So in Japan, tests using the, um, the PISA test is the real big one they give to 15 year olds. Uh, they give the PISA test to Japanese students. They've locked the bottom 33% off of their academic roster. Now, how, where do you think America would test if we locked off the bottom 33%. We'd be pretty good. We're really good. Um, the UK, I remember one time, um, the, the, the school right next was with Doha College, which was the British, um, the British International School. And Doha College, those kids took a test in seventh grade that determined whether they could get into their high school. And if they didn't score high enough, they had to go another track. Um, my German, uh, my best friend is German. Uh, his brother tested into the lower vocational track. Norbert tested into the higher track. So Norbert could go to university, his brother could not. The great failing of the American system is we believe we should keep everybody in the system because sometimes kids figure it out at 25. And they do. Uh, I read an article my first year overseas <coughs> written from a, 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 somebody in Australia. And he was saying, it was about workers. If you want somebody to replicate a process, so if that's what you're doing, you, you're, you're trying to take a process, you're just trying to replicate it, you gotta, you gotta hire Chinese to do that. If you want somebody to do calculations, just algorithms, calculations, those are the Indians. But if you need anybody to think creatively, you have to hire an American. Not a North American, you kind of excluded the Canadians. You have to hire Americans. They're the only ones that their system allows critical thinking and kids to be able to learn to think. And I saw it. I saw it in our internet. We were an American curriculum school, and we had kids from 79 countries, and we would send kids back to Germany. We sent a kid who was very average in our school. He went back to Germany, and his mom was worried whether he was going to be able to function in the German system because the German system is very different. They advanced him a whole year. So he was, whatever, sixth grade, they moved him to eighth grade. Seventh, eighth, sixth to seventh, whatever it was, seventh to eighth. And he was in their highest track of classes. This is a kid that was just kind of average in our system. And I am, I am convinced after my 10 years overseas that the American education system is the best one in the world. Um, we just, we just, we test everybody. China, you see those PISA tests? It's, it's such a racket. The Chinese tell PISA, the schools and the geographic location that they can test their kids. 
and because the Pisa organization wants Chinese kids, they, they do that. They would come to our school, and the way it works is when they take this Pisa test, the 15-year-olds, they come, you give them a roster, and then they randomly select kids to take the test. That's, that's how they do it. That's not how it happens in other countries. In South Korea, they select the kids. And they, and they, they tell them they can't do it, they say, fine, we won't take the test. So the American system is not as bad as kind of Americans have been led to believe. Doesn't mean we don't have things that we need to fix. It doesn't mean that. It's just uh, I've, I've, seen, I've seen other systems. And uh, I don't know. There's a reason why we outproduce everybody in the world. There's a reason why. So. OK. This is what I call talking them into submission. Uh, so uh, those were the questions of Paige. Everybody give Paige a hand. So, and with that, I will allow you to bow out and exit if you would like. Um, I'll stay for anybody who wants to ask questions, or you know, if you, if you didn't get enough, I can give you a little more. Um, but thank you. I am, um, if you can't tell, I'm, I'm pretty excited to come to work here. Um, I, I can't wait to get started, um, and uh, I, I look forward to the journey with you. So thank you for coming. <laughs>